You three are the MVPs, the real stars. Welcome. So we're going to have a really casual conversation. Um, feel free at any point to dip in. Um, welcome so much to Nairobi, to Makondo for a moment, Makondo Literary Festival. My name is Alea. We don't have a lot of time, so I'm going to dive right in, also because I'm very greedy. Um, we have Jethro Sutar, who is a writer, translator, editor, correct? Um, I'm going to ask you to introduce your, the way that you like to be introduced to us. Um, we have Yovanka, also a writer, and uh, Jesse Musa as well. I, I, al I always find that I love to hear introductions from the person themselves and the way that they like to be introduced. Um, and Jesse Musa, if I speak too fast, just let me know. <laughs> Welcome so much. Um, how, how do you like to be known? Thank you for, for welcoming, and thank you for uh, welcoming to the festival, and for those who are, are here, early birds. Um, you, well, I will introduce myself, but you, you, you picked the right words. I'm a translator, but I am a writer. I mean, any translation, they are my words. I have written them, and if I wasn't a good writer, I could be a brilliant linguist, but you have to be a good writer to, to, to translate. So I'm a, a writer and a translator. And an editor, yes, we've got some of the, the, the books here. I did translate these ones, but the, the, I uh, am an editor for the, for the imprint with Yovanka as well, called Deadless Africa. But I'm also a bit of an agent, really. If I, uh, translators are, uh, often work like this, if you find an author that you like and want to translate, you often have to make the effort of getting hold of the book, reading it, doing a sample translation, finding a, a publisher, trying to interest them. And that doesn't just mean making the sample translation brilliant, but also persuading them there's a market, maybe finding them some possible funding uh, avenues. So yeah, it's writer, translator, in this case, editor and agent. And to finish the introduction, uh, I am from England, I'm from a city in the north called Sheffield, but I now live in Lisbon, uh, and I have also lived in, in Brazil, so uh, Portuguese uh, comes from Brazil and, uh, uh, and Lisbon, but I also translate Spanish, so I have translated uh, two novels from Equatorial Guinea, which is the only sort of uh, official Spanish-speaking uh, country, although it technically uh, is in the League of Portuguese-speaking nations, even though that's not really true. Welcome, Jethro. And Jethro has also translated um, The Mad Woman of Serrano um, from Cape, Cape Verde by Dina Salusio. And there'll be a session later on this evening around that. So make sure you stick around. Welcome, Yovanka. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so my name is Yovanka Paquet Perdigão. And um, I usually introduce myself as a writer from Guinea-Bissau. Uh, I was born in Portugal, but I've lived in Ivory Coast, mostly in Senegal, and moved to London. I've been living there for the past 10 years. <laughs> and then I basically started to get into translation, and that's how actually I met Jethro. Um, I started to, uh, as a writer, going to literature events in London, and then realized that um, even though they, most of the events called themselves African, there was no representation of Lucifer in Africa. So that's how my interest in translation started because I realized there wasn't a lot of works translated into English. And yeah, so I'm a writer, translator, and you know, all around cheerleader for Lucifer in Africa. <laughs> Welcome, Ivanka. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, good morning. My name is Jesse Musi Cassinda. Uh, I'm from Mozambique. I I am a publisher, specifically a publisher and a journalist. Uh, I'm running a publishing house called The Atale. Uh, it's a publishing house uh, which is doing specific two things. One is to discover new voices for Mozambican literature. And the second thing is to republish some classical African books uh, published specifically between 1980 to 1990. 
and we also uh, translate some African books that is not exist in Portuguese. My interest is different. <laughs> Yovanka is uh, taking books from Portuguese to English, and we are taking books from another language to Portuguese, because uh, in Mozambique as well, in Angola, uh, many readers do not know more about African literature written in another language. They also know African literature written in Portuguese, as well uh, Brazilian and Portuguese literature. Thank you. Thank you, Jason Musi. So today it's the first session of Macondo Literary Festival. And this is a session about trends, stories, writers. It's a, a little introduction into the Lusophone space. Um, a few years ago, perhaps, maybe a couple of years ago on Twitter, a trend started around if your African country was uh, someone at the bar, I think. Do you remember? Does anyone remember it? You remember it? Yes? Uh, and, and what, what, would you, what would your African country be in the bar? Would they be the drunkard by the side? Would they be the girl getting down on the dance floor? And it spurred off this like pan-African conversation. So I would like to ask you, each of you, from your experience in the literary space that you are part of, if, if you were able to describe it, if we were to walk in and get dropped in the middle, what are people interested in reading about? What are the writers interested in writing about? What does the space feel like um, to somebody who has, has no interaction with it before, as if I, as if I were an alien? Yeah. <laughs> um, oh, that's a really hard question. <laughs> um, so what would the space look like? I think it's, um, well, I can speak for maybe for Guinea-Bissau and just also wider Lucifer in Africa. I think the space, what, what it looks like is people are actually still, um, there's a lack of knowledge about how to actually enter literature spaces, mm -hmm. even within Lusophone Africa, and especially in Guinea-Bissau. Um, there's also a, a feeling of feeling invisible. Mm -hmm. um, so just the other day, I actually shared the Miles Morland scholarship with some writers from Guinea-Bissau, and most of them were emailing back and saying, oh, but I don't have a work translated into English, so how can I access, how can we benefit from these things? Um, but the kind of stories I think people are st still telling or talking about have a lot to do with our, the Guinea-Bissau's Guinea past. Mm -hmm. um, so I think as a nation, we're still trying to grapple with our colonial and post-colonial past. Mm -hmm. And um, we have actually the novel, the first novel to be translated into English from Guinea-Bissau by Jethro, uh, right here by Abdullah Sila. It's called The Ultimate Tragedy which actually ha is um, a tale basically of colonialism uh, about women trying to choose between two men and what they represent. Um, and I think these are so, still some of the stories we're telling and talking about. And we haven't quite moved into telling more modern his stories. Mm -hmm. So for example, um, I'm from Guinea-Bissau. I left at the age of six in 1998 because of a civil war. And like many of my counterparts, uh, most of us actually live in the diaspora. A lot of us are highly educated, speak several languages, French, English, Russian, Spanish. And we live across Europe, the US, and, and other places in Africa. And even though there's large communities of people from Guinea-Bissau, um, I could just say like, I'm from London. If you go to Hackney, you will definitely hear Creole from Guinea-Bissau. Uh, if you go to Senegal, there's large communities, uh, people getting together, food, celebrations. But we don't have writing that talks about these experiences of being from Guinea-Bissau and moving to the US post the conflict. We don't have stories about what it means to be black British, but coming from Guinea-Bissau. We don't have also stories about what does it mean to come from a country that most of us have not been able to go back because there are not many opportunities because of political 
um, issues. Mm -hmm. um, what it also means, particularly for me, um, it's been quite of a struggle when I say I'm from Guinea-Bissau. Most people actually don't know <laughs> where Guinea-Bissau is. Yeah. And, you know, I get a lot of questions like, um, are you from Papua New Guinea? You know, so <laughs> people have no, you know, I've even spoken with Nigerians and uh, they'll be like, is that, in, is that in Africa? And I'm like, yes, it's on the same side <laughs> as you. Um, and they'll be like, oh, you, so you speak French, right? I'm like, no, no. <laughs> Portuguese Africa. <laughs> Um, so there's just also this burden of representing and explaining constantly and lots of people see it as almost coming from an exotic part of Africa mm -hmm. and questions about, oh, do, is everybody look like you? Is it, is it really an African country? Mm -hmm. And I also find that there's a lot of um, times where people sort of have this idea that in Lucifer Africa, our experience with colonialism was more, um, more peaceful. Mm -hmm. Because lots of people have this impression that because there's a lot of, they meet a lot of people that are either light skin or mixed race, mixed with uh, Portuguese, that it must mean that you know, racism mm -hmm. is something that we, don't, we didn't experience or that or the Portuguese, I often have been told, oh, but the Portuguese were very nice coloni colonizers um, because you know, they made so many babies. And, you know, they might have. Uh, there's actually a funny joke that says, um, what did the English leave? Administration. What did the French leave? Architecture. What did the Portuguese leave? Children. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and many of those stories are it, true, but uh, there's also a lot of tragedies in there. So, for example, my grandmother, who is half Portuguese, uh, was a result of an illicit love affair, for example. Um, and many other people also have this heritage but never have had actually a relationship with Portugal or even these so-called white parents. Mm -hmm. And also, you know, historically, I don't know if most people might not know, but Mozambique, Angola, Guinea-Bissau, uh, San Tomé, we all actually had really long w civil wars yeah. with the colonial power of this Portugal mm -hmm. at the time, huge losses. And we're still actually recovering. We only got independence about 30 to 35 years. And that's something that people just are still not aware. So that's, I think, the scene. And like I was saying, we haven't yet, um, I think the, we're not as developed, I would say, in terms of our literature, because we have only got our independence. So we're still trying to understand what does that even mean. Yeah. And, and I mean, even that we're having this conversation where we're defining our parts of the continent through a European space is a tragedy. Mm -hmm. Lusophone Africa and Anglophone Africa. Yeah. It's almost as if who we are in how we know each other mm. is via another, an oppressive power. Yeah. Because it's not even just another continent, it was an oppressive power. Mm. And, I, and, and, you know, so much of what you say um, really resonates even as a Kenyan in trying to understand who we are sort of outside of colonialism. It feels like that's how we were defined in some ways. Mm. Um, in, in terms of um, Jessamusa with Mozambique, one of the things that I found really interesting is the crime anthology that um, your publishing house is publishing. Uh, it sort of goes counter to the idea of, okay, let me, let me rephrase my question. <laughs> what are the sorts of things that are being written about in Mozambique? Um, and what's most interesting and exciting to you as a publisher? Okay, thank you. Uh, in Mozambique, oh, the Mozambican literature has, uh, now divided in three uh, periods. There is a first period from 1960 to 1975. Uh, the literature of this time, the times of uh, poets such as Jose Craverinha and Noemi, Noemi de Souza, was the struggle against the colonialism. And in 1977, when the civil war uh, started, between uh, Renamo Part and the governor were run by Frelimo, uh, the main, uh, the 
part of the independence. There is, they created the conditions to start a new kinds of literature. That's literature written by writers such as Angolani Bakakosa, uh, with his Walalape, and Mia Couto, as well, uh, João Paulo Borges Coelho, and um, Eduardo White, and many, many, many writers. They use it to tell another stories about the official story. Uh, you know what's happened. When Mozambique became independent, um, everybody knows that, okay, now is our time. They use it to leave the poor neighborhoods and they move it herself or themselves to the center of the city to manage companies, to manage all things in the center of the city. But many of that people were not prepared in terms of knowledge to manage such things. This is why the countries got down and create the condition for start new literature about the new stories, new stories about the war. There was an official stories that the war, the war was run by Renamo Party. But when we read books such as Walalapi and such as Ukomboyo de Salasukar, Kumboyo de Salasukar, okay, it's the train of salt and sugar of uh, Licinio de Azevedo, uh, books such as Mia Couto's book, we, meet another stories of the war run by the official. You know what's happened? Uh, I give my confidence for you, to you protect myself against another, another one, but there is not another one who is fighting with me, but is yourself who is fighting against me. But I give you a confidence to protect me. This is what's happened at this time, and now, we are living the two kinds of Mozambique. We have uh, the Mozambiques of the neighborhoods and the Mozambiques of the center of the seeds. This is why in our collective dictionary of imagination, we have two words. One word is cidade, it means seat, and another word is neighborhood, it means bairro. Uh, but the neighborhoods are within the city, but we do not call the neighborhoods as a seat. We say, okay, I'm going to Cidad, or I'm going to Bairro. Where do you live? I live at Bairro. Where do you live? I live at Cidad. And the literature now being produced, uh, discussing about such things, such different things. We are living all in Maputo, but in Maputo we have two seats, Bairro and Cidad. Yes, yes, thank you. That's really interesting. Um, Jethro, uh, what are the stories that are getting privileged in terms of being translated to English? And what are we not, what's being hidden? What are we not getting access to? Um, yeah, there's obviously I have a slightly different perspective as a sort of outsider looking for these stories. And um, there's kind of two sides to it. There's, there's what, which stories exist but aren't getting translated and, and which stories just don't exist. Um, because, you know, you're saying it's Lusophone, Anglophone. Uh, I translate Portuguese, but as an editor, I was interested in, you know, it, it, are there stories, are there novels in Creole from Guinea-Bissau in Cape Verde? Can we maybe translate them? But they don't really exist. So... I've asked you know, uh, Cape Verdeans, Dina and, and, and other friends, and they say, no, I, I like Creole to write maybe poems or, or music, maybe even a short story, but nah, it's not, it's, it, it's not for a novel. It, it, uh, the, the, Amilcar Cabral was quite positive about Portuguese, so maybe it's, it's different relationship to in some other places, but people who I would have expected, sort of writers I would have expected to champion Creole, don't, uh, they, 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 they think it's, it, the language it doesn't yet serve uh, a purpose for, for, for a novel. And what does that mean? Well, I suppose it means that the writers who are writing the stories, you know, maybe there's lots of people who don't really speak Portuguese or not comfortable in it, 
they're not writing stories in Creole, but realistically, would they be writing stories anyway? Probably not. The, you know, the, there are other priorities in life. Uh, when when life's hard, you're you're not thinking, oh, I'll write my novel. You're thinking, you know, food on the table, look after the kids. Um, you find, therefore, as well, whether I'm looking for work in Angola or Cape Verde or wherever, and you think, right, we want more women authors. And, and again, you, you don't find as many novels. Uh, again, short stories, poetry, there's, there's more options. Why would that be? I suppose, again, but the, 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 there'd be a practical elements to that. Also, barriers, are they being encouraged? Are they, you know... The, the man intellectual is obviously he still gets a better platform. So yeah, there's there's there's, there's difficulties on that front, uh, as in the, the the sort of the raw materials that we as translators can can use. Secondly, yeah, what what uh, as managing an, a, a publisher, we can try and do things differently. But yeah, if you send a, a story to a, a major publisher in London from going to make this up, but let's say Kinshasa, and it's about two friends going to, they go, oh, but where's the, you know, where's the Africanness? Uh, no, it's, it's a story in a, a city, but it's contemporary. To, no, of course, still, there's a sort of a cliched thing that, 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 that people look for or expect. I'd say that's changing a bit, uh, partly through readership uh, and economics of, of people buying books, but, uh, but yeah, expectations are still a little bit... Uh, stuck in the past in that sense. Thanks, Jethro. I mean, in carrying on with this idea of translation, um, it feels almost as if when it's translated to English, it is for the West, it is not for Anglophone Africa. And so it's almost like the stories that, um, that, that look out that way are the ones that get translated. Um, in, how do you think, do, do you see that changing in any way and what would it require, do you think, to, to be able to access um, African stories in English for Africans? Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. I mean, just to go off a very slight tangent, but on Jackie, who's the Angolan author here and you know, has lived in Brazil and Lisbon and, uh, you know, is a, a very open and engaged reader and writer, he has never read Dina's book in Portuguese because he's just never seen it anywhere. So that shows that even before they're translated, this book is not finding its way to other Portuguese-speaking African countries. So there's a distribution problem at many, many sort of levels. Yovanka, I'd love to hear your thoughts as well. Um, for me, I actually sort of disagree a little bit because the experience I've had of sort of championing Lucifer and African literature in English-speaking African spaces, um, I can give actually an example that I was trying to um, promote this Angolan writer whose book um, is divided in three parts. And two out of the three points of view in the book are basically uh, two white people one is a, um, a guy who's Norwegian, and he's a police officer, and he's talking about his relationship to music and hip-hop and, and talks about immigration in Norway. Uh, the second sort of point of view was the, the daughter, the stepdaughter of an Angolan man living in Lisbon who dances kizomba and you know, is really in touch with African music, the African scene. And the third one was an Angolan point of view of a man traveling through Europe. And when I tried to sort of speak about and promote this book, um, some of the reactions I got actually from other Africans that speak English was that, why is it, they, said, they basically said, I'm looking for an authentic Lucifer African story. And why did he choose to have two out of three uh, white people telling, being basically the principal uh, characters in, the, in his novel. And I tried to explain why that, and I don't think they got it, because there's this assumption as well, um, when people want to publish stories from Lucifer in Africa, what they ask is, oh, I want something authentic, something 
you know, like uh, things fall up, your things have fall apart, you know, where it's just Afrocentric, it's just Africans talking to each other. And the issue is that, w again, going back to colonization, um, the influence of Portugal in many of the Lusophone African countries was tremendous. And it's a very, very different experience than in other places like Nigeria, Kenya, um, in terms of how our societies were even built and even came so close together. Mm -hmm. And I think even when you go to Portugal, just in a, going back to the example of this lady who was teaching Kizomba in the book, when you go to Portugal, um, por I, and I'm not saying that you know the relationship is a specific one, but in Portugal, although they do not promote African <laughs> literature, you can't even find actually a loose of an African book in most bookshops. There is this strange thing that happens that a lot of the African culture is actually being promoted by Portuguese people themselves. Mm -hmm. So Kizomba, which is a dance that originated from Angola, a dance across Lusophone Africa. If you go to Portugal, your dance teacher will be white. Right. You know? So there's this thing, and I was basically trying to explain, for example, I, as much as I say I'm from Guinea-Bissau, I was born in Portugal. Um, my father, ancestors come, come from Coimbra, and my name, Pertigão, is an extremely Portuguese name, you know. Um, my other heritage also comes from Portugal, so as, as I was saying, my grandmother was half Portuguese, mm -hmm. you know. So I see myself as African, but at the same time, I have had a relationship with Portugal, with whiteness, and it's a very complicated so if I was to tell my story, I couldn't tell my story without mentioning Portugal. Right. And as I say, it's very complicated because I lived in Portugal for many years. And funny enough, uh, I was living, with, I was raised by my grandparents in this neighborhood in Lisbon. And in that same neighborhood, my grandmother's white brothers used to live in that neighborhood. And she used to go to the same hairdresser as one of the wives of his, of her brothers, but they never said hello. They never, she never acknowledged. So there's a family, I guess, that we have that's never acknowledged the fact that they have mm -hmm. an African side of the family. Right. So it's really hard to talk about an authentic because our experiences are not like um, in Nigeria or other places. And just like actually Jesse was saying, we also in Guinea-Bissau have this division of Bairu, Cidad, and you know, for example, I can't, I don't have a village in Guinea-Bissau. I'm actually from just a city. And lots of people are actually from Lusophone Africa. Can, or sometimes, because of your particular history, you might have been a more of a city person. Right. So I can't write a story about being in an African village, you know, that right. authentic African history. So I think, for me, there is an issue where, yes, we are writing, I think, in Lusophone Africa towards the West, but I don't find that there's a willingness in the African-speaking world to actually listen to Lucifer Africa. I've been living in London and going to many African festivals. And, you know, I, for example, I used to work for Africa Rights. I used to go to Africa Rights many times. It's only, um, I think about two years ago that they had Abdullah Sila, the first person from Lucifer Africa writer that they invited. And that was, this, I think, the sixth year. Mm -hmm. And the reason why they invited him was because I insisted. <laughs> so, you know, and people say, oh, language, you know. And I'm like, well, I, I speak Portuguese, I speak English, I speak French. And lots of us speak, you know, you speak English, you're here. Yeah. So you can find these people, yeah. you know. Thank okay. you for sharing that, Yovanka. I think that, I mean, I'm certainly guilty of centering, you know, my Kenyan experience as the African experience and doing the same thing that I get frustrated at others for doing. Thank you for calling me out on that. <laughs> um, it's, I mean, it really is, I think for many of us here, our first introduction. And it's startling, the expectation is that there will be so much similarity and it's startling, I think, to hear where the differences lie, I suppose, is, is uh, something I'm, I'm learning in this moment. Um, Jesse Musa, I want to hear more about the stories that come out from the two spaces. Are they different, the stories that come out from the city versus from the 
viral? Is viral? But, yeah. Uh, okay, thank you. I would like to beg for the question of translation yes, and distribution. Please. Oh my gosh, please, yes. Yes, because we are working on. Uh, we were running a festival in 2016. Uh, short story uh, prize were integrated in a festival in north of Mozambique. And in Maputo, uh, there do not exist more African books available in Portuguese in our bookstores. When you go to a bookstore in Maputo, you will find more uh, European or Western books than African books. This is why we use it to demand for someone who was traveling to Portugal to buy for us 10 books for 10 African offers for different countries as well, 10, uh, 10 African countries. When uh, he was at library, at bookstore in Lisbon, uh, the, books, the bookseller said that uh, we don't have many uh, African books of uh, different countries, but we have many African books from Mozambique and Angola. And okay, we say, can you buy it? When he bought, he bought 10 books. Uh, seven books was by Portuguese authors who used it to live in Mozambique and Angola during the colonial times, working for colonial offices. And three was for really, really African authors. One on Jack's book and one uh, Mia Kote and Paulina Shizian's book. This thing invited us to think what we have to do to turn uh, African literature available for Mozambique spaces. And when we started thinking about, we used it to back to Portugal and say, okay, now we don't want African books, now we want translators. We want translators who can do our job to translate in books from English, French, to Portuguese. This is why we started to running a project of translations in our publishing house. And about the stories uh, between neighborhoods and seeds. Uh, we have two kinds of stories. Uh, we have uh, rural stories, uh, specifically stories written by Ngulani, Mia Koutou, Paulina Shiziani. Uh, the stories that happen specifically in the rural spaces. And the story written by how I can say, contemporary writers, such as Melio Tinga, Lucilio Manjati, Pedro Pereira Lopes, uh, many, many, many of these authors, the stories are happening on the seeds. And we don't have a different story between Bairro and the Cidade, no. We have the same story, uh, the character moving from the Bairro to the seeds and the changing his personality to be integrated within the in the bio or in the cidad. Thank you, Jesse Muse. I um, this has been such a great introduction um, to some of the issues that we not issues. I mean, just the world that that we often don't. Uh, get invited to, get access to, walk into, um, you know, all those words. I, I would like to invite the audience to ask some questions. Um, just looking at the time. Yeah, we do have time. Um, does anyone in the audience have a question or two, a comment, conversation? Yes, there. Um, here, I'll pass the mic around. Um, my name is Ali Abilati. I'm part of the team. I'm working on the social media and it happened that I read one of the author's books. I'm from a Somali setting and many things have happened in Africa and I wanted to understand your experience as writers. For instance, what actually happened in my family is what actually made me believe to write. Most of my family members departed in the Somalian civil war, and there were refugees 
in the European countries. But they've all, um, when they were raising their children, and those children actually came back, they couldn't eat the food that we eat. Um, they wanted to be treated differently. And being a young boy, I think you can also write about this. Um, being a young boy, I've always thought you are the same because we had the same grandfather. However, they've all, um, one of them in the family have, um, has always told me early, I wanted to write about Somalia. But I've never been in Somalia. I've been raised in the United States of America for the longest time in my life. So what answers as you authors would provide to those citizens who are American citizens, although their native nature is in Africa, what would you advise such young writers, young authors? Could they write or should they write or are they even allowed to write? So those are the answers that I wanted you authors to give us and it would be of significant importance for Macondo Literary Festival. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, thank you so much for your question. Um, I really, it really resonates with me because um, similarly to the people you're speaking of, um, I left at the age of six in Ibisao and I went back when I was um, like almost 20 years after. And the truth, the truth is I'm, I am actually a, a child of the diaspora. And at the same time, I'm not, I lived only about three or four years in Portugal. I don't feel a very strong connection to Portugal. I've lived in Ivory Coast and Senegal, but I never, I always felt like an outsider. So I, I can't call myself like a Senegalese writer or Ivorian writer. Um, and it's difficult to, I think, going back to your question, I think it doesn't matter. I think if you want to write about a place, you have the right to write about a place. A lot of my writing is about Kidebisao, about my personal experience in the conflict. Because I think for me, at least, um, because I didn't see myself represented and because I didn't see any positive stories of Guinea-Bissau, I felt like I had to write it. And I felt like nobody's writing it. And if I don't do it, and especially with having actually the privilege of speaking English and being able to write English, it's very, very important. Uh, I remember when I was in uh, an American school in Senegal, uh, we had this class called Global Issues. And the teacher printed this news story, which was about Guinea-Bissau. And in this news story, they were basically saying, so you know, I don't know if you guys know, but Guinea-Bissau since 1998 has been pretty much a political shambles. Um, and so the news story said that Guinea-Bissau was so poor that the police did not have, um, I think you call it shackles? So handcuffs. So when they'd catch people committing crimes, they didn't, they didn't have handcuffs. That's how poor they were. And when the class read that, everybody started to laugh. Everybody was just rinsing me, saying, like, oh my gosh, you're from Guinea-Bissau. It's so poor, there's nothing happening there. And at, at the time, so Guinea-Bissau is now being talked about as a, from a micro state to a narco state. It's, a, it's seen as a country where most of the drugs from Latin America come through and to Europe. Um, even though it's not the only country, and it's definitely not the country that is, receives the most drugs. Um, and I remember I actually crying after the class because I was so embarrassed and because I, there was nothing I could say. There was no other stories out there. And for me, also, it became really strange because I'd sometimes I'd sit in other uh, sort of meetings and then I remember this person, they were talking about trends in Africa for the next year. And this person was like, well, Guinea-Bissau, they've had elections. Once again, they can't, um, I don't know what was happening, but something like, oh, they can't get it together. You know, that's the trend for the coming year. And everybody in the table, which was 
you know, there was one Nigerian woman and then all of them were white. They all just started laughing. They're all just business as usual. And I remember feeling really incensed because I was like, I have a lot of family living in Guinea-Bissau. I've lost a lot of family because of the war, because of the politics, you know. And I felt like for other people, this is it's just a joke. It's not seen as serious. And, you know, that's what compelled me to actually want to write. But at the same time, my writing is not just about Guinea-Bissau, actually. It's about Lucifer Africa. So I'm also from Saint Tomé Príncipe by my grandfather. And it's when I started researching, when I went back to Guinea-Bissau after 20 years, and I started to realize, for me, the impact that actually Portuguese colonialism had on my own family, that I started to want to tell stories from Lucifer in Africa. Because, for example, my grandfather went to jail and was tortured by the Portuguese during colonialism for supporting independence. You know, there's a lot of atrocities that the Portuguese committed, and they're not talked about. You know, there are massacres that, you know, they say, for example, in Santa Maria, there was a massacre that happened during colonial times that they say it was so bad, they were throwing bodies into the water, and the water around the island was red because of the blood. And these are things that even, uh, you know, some of my speakers were actually mentioned that even in Lucifer Africa, we don't have that much knowledge about our past, our history, and other histories from different countries. And we don't really talk to each other. And so I think it's very important that your family members actually do write those stories and feel, you know, go back and research. Because I think sometimes, even if you are a member of the diaspora, if you, sometimes it comes with a certain privilege. And that's how I feel. The fact that I can speak and write in English, I'm trying to use that in order to shine a light in these stories. Um, my position's different, but I face similar doubts, I think. How can I write? I'm a white boy from a northern city in England. How can I write as Abdullah Sila? And how do I do that? Well, I, by earning the right to. And how do I earn the right? Well, as Yovanka said, by research, by recognizing that I have a certain privileged platform, so let's use that for good things, but earning the right by being humble enough to not assume I know better about it, but quite the opposite, research, find out things, uh, 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 and yeah, earn that right to, to write in that voice and tell that story. Uh, yes, there's things happening in, in Mozambique, a, a great conflict about of identity. Because we are, as Mia Kot called, a nation into the nations. Because we are more than 20 tribes, and each tribe represents a place, a specific place, with specific rules and specific cultural things. Uh, Many young writers, uh, specific writers in the age of FET and FET5, they were born in the center of the cities. With, uh, for instance, Mada uh, Chichewa and Father Makua, born in the center of Maputo. And he never traveled even to Tete province, even to Nampula province. He grew up in the center of the city of Maputo. Uh, I do remember one day Ngulan says, yeah, but, uh, 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 please relate, yeah, vocês escrevem sem chão. <laughs> I don't, uh, sem chão, chão. Okay, you, you are writing. You write without the, without the ground or without the... Exactly, because uh, for his perspective, uh, the chão <laughs> or the, the ground could be our culture. The, uh, that culture which uh, Yovanka called the authentic culture. But okay, my ground is this. Right. I was born in this, in the center of the city. This is my ground. Yeah. What I have to do? I have to change my history to go back for, my, for your village as my father, for your village as my mother, to be born again. I think, no, my ground is this. Unfortunately, my ground is this. I was born in the center of the city. This is my story. 
and my identity could be that conflict born in the center of the city with a father and mother coming for, from rural areas and representing two different tribes. Yeah, thank you, Jesse Muse. I mean, it's the authentic, the, this idea of authenticity, I mean, really, what is it even, right? If, if, you, if you are writing about your reality, it is your reality, and nobody else has the right to tell you that it is or it isn't. And I feel like that's similar here is there's a new generation that, that are interested or, or are exploring different things, not always the things that came from before. Thank you very much for sharing those thoughts. Um, I hope that gave you, yeah, <laughs> we're getting a thumbs up. <laughs> um, anybody else would like to ask a question? Feel free, yes. Thank you. Um, hello, my name is Carsten, and um, I feel very much like an outsider here. <laughs> um, one reason is I just arrived four weeks ago uh, to Nairobi, and um, I, w I will stay at least for two years, so I'm here to learn about Africa and just learn. <laughs> and uh, the other thing I, I like to read, but I don't feel anyhow as a literary professional or somebody who knows things, and I'm just very gladly by meeting Anya that I can help you as a volunteer, so. Um, and I learn a lot, and it's great to meet all of you. Um, this discussion just reminded me of an experience that I had. Um, I, I know a bit more and was more in South America, and um, I always thought that literature is a very good way to to learn about people and culture, and uh, because sometimes when you go somewhere, it's hard to get so close to people and really understand them because they will be friendly and tell you what you might would like to hear and all this. So I like to read um, literature from these places. And then I in, in South America, I bought a book and it was. It was translated in, into German, I'm, I'm German, and uh, if I translate it, it's called South American Fairy Tales. And um, for me as a German, maybe you know the Grimm Brothers, this is like one of the European sources of fairy tales, so I have in my head how fairy tales work. And none of the stories in that book <laughs> were very remotely close to my idea of fairy tales. And, uh, and even more crazy was I didn't get the stories at all. They had they had no moral idea behind. There was no conclusion at the end. I felt um, so. By the way, the stories were told. I was totally I don't know irritated, and and it was even difficult for me to to keep on reading the stories because I also didn't really enjoy them. So, but I kept on reading because it was. So that's the way they tell stories. And, um, uh, and so I'm going to uh, ask you perhaps to cut it a little bit yes, short. Sorry. And come, yes, uh, yeah, yes. Uh -huh. So I'm, <laughs> I'm coming to my question. So, so, I was, so I was wondering, or I believe that there will also be narrative ways in Africa that are different from the ways that I'm used to stories. But the thing is, when you want to publish and sell a book, and start a dialogue. You need the narrative that people are used to. And then the question is, where does, do these narratives come from? And um, so do you think that the ways we are generally used to tell stories, is this maybe already a somehow European way, this, the way to, to tell it? Um, do you need to use these ways? Are there different ways, and I believe there are, which which wouldn't be accessible for, sorry, well, let's say, who are now used to different storytelling. So this is my questions. And are there, if there are, then in in your literature, how do you do this? And that's also maybe an interesting question for translation process. So I hope to make myself clear. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> Thank you. The mic again. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I find that actually the elusive in Africa 
the kind of writing that is coming out or has been produced, and especially in Mozambique, um, my favorite book actually that is called Terra Sunambla, Sea Walking Land by Mia Koto. And I find that the way he narrates the story reminds me a lot actually about uh, magical realism from Latin America. And the reason why I like so much Miyakoto and literature, uh, quite similar to Miyakoto's type of writing that you can also find in Angola, was that I felt that he captures the unthinkable and makes it, normalizes it. And I think as someone who, I, I grew up in, yeah, although I grew up in different places, I grew up in a Bissau Guinean household with grandparents from San Tome and Guinea-Bissau. And there would always be things that I guess Westerners would say magical happening. But in our household, they were not seen as magical, they were seen as part of the daily life. And how Miyakot, for example, describes conflict, civil war, and how it affects people's psyches is my actual experience. So even though we went through a very traumatic experience as a family, we never actually talked about it as if it's in a traumatic way, you know. Uh, some of us even had PTSD, but we didn't use the language of PTSD. We didn't use the Western language to talk about these experiences. We instead used the language of humor, of magic, of just events being surreal. And I guess it, it could be for people that are not used to this contest that's strange or how the narrative goes. I remember the NC Walking Land there's a part where there's um, a man is basically telling the story about how his brother, um, they needed to hide the brother to avoid him being, I think, recruited. And so the family decided to put the brother inside a chicken coop. And the brother spent so much time in the chicken coop that he began to be a chicken. He couldn't speak anymore. Uh, he acted like a chicken and then he transformed into a chicken. He was no longer a human, you know. And when I was reading that, to me, it didn't feel strange. I didn't, I believed it even, because I know that even in my own culture, we have stories like that where it defies any logic. Um, and I think in my, I don't see it as a challenge, actually, because um, I think at the moment there are, we are right now, when it comes to African literature, I think we need to continue to be bold in telling our stories. I think there's been movements to, for example, lots of conversations about uh, using African languages in fiction and not translating them. Whereas before, I think most African writers would feel compelled to translate the one sentence they use. But now you can read books and there's no translation. And the writer's almost saying, you know, figure it out, basically. And I think it's, I, I think it's important to keep being bold in that. And I think what makes a good story at the end of the day is because we are all, um, I'm sorry to say uh, this very, uh, I don't know how you say that, but very obvious thing, we're, we're all human. Um, a good story resonates with people because we all have similar shared experiences. Even if you haven't experienced what conflict is, the thought, you can imagine yourselves going through the experience and the, exp the human experience you have of losing everything, of the reactions and the things, that's something that you can sort of identify, even if it's a little bit. So I think I would say that for African writers in Lucifer Africa that I found write quite differently actually from other English speaking places, I think they should continue actually to invest in that unique quality and to just tell a good story and people will understand regardless. Um, from the translator uh, or editing perspective, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I read books and eventually, you know, I have to like them to make the effort to go through, but I have to check myself as well. And I'm used to, like you say, a beginning, middle, end, some kind of momentum, what's going to happen. Um, there are very many different ways to say that, and from having read more widely, you see there's lots of ways to tell a story. Uh, 
And I think readers, that there is a mood in the world due to politics as well as any other things. There is a kind of a quest for the authentic, as in, you know, if you can give a book, say, this is how a story is told here. It's not been packaged specifically for this market. This is, this is real. There is an appetite for that. I'd also say, you know, I've read things that are, are difficult, but it's interesting, isn't it? That book that you didn't like, it stayed with you. You're talking about it here years later. It's never gone. You have to think, wow, there's different ways to tell a story. I don't get this. Uh, and it's, it, it was good. You know, it, it, it did something. So, yeah, we have to be bold. Trust the readers. They're going to get a reaction. It might not be the usual one, but it'll, it'll, it'll stay there. I'm not a writer, I'm a publisher. Uh, I'm interested this especially in diversity. This is why uh, I don't have a problems to share in the same anthology uh, stories, uh, stories with ground and stories without grounds. But I want to share this diversity in our publishing house. This is why we publish uh, authors different, representing different points of views of life. Thank you, Jesse. We have time for one last question. Uh, my name is Momani Osoro. Now, my question was, when you look at Western trends in writing, most of them, there is there's this issue of commercial fiction which when you look at African writers and the African publishing scene, commercial fiction has not been pushed as much to, to people. Like for, when you look, read African, African writing, most of it is narrative arts and everyone is talking about culture, identity, and realism and magical things, things like that. So I was asking uh, as writers, how do you, is it possible for an upcoming African writer to try to explore the field of commercial fiction, not just for, let's say, for the, for the money in it, but as a, new, as a new part of writing and as, as also an African publisher? How can you respond to commercial fiction or the, the let's say, the, the reading market in Africa? Is it really developed to, to take in commercial fiction? Yeah, that was my question. You are, you are asking me difficult things, you know, because <laughs> as a publisher, I have to publish and sell books. But you know why I became a publisher? I not became a publisher because I won't get money. I became a publisher because I love stories. This is what I think best. When I receive a manuscript, I will read it and think as a story lover, not think as a managing director of a publishing house or want gaining money or things, whatever like that. Um, I, don't, I don't know if I have an answer to that. I just know that it's very difficult as a writer in the West, you work you were expected to write a story about your identity and how you feel and you know this and there's also trends even i think when it comes to african literature i think when for example americana by shimamanda adichie came out i saw so many books writing about you know what it means to be african in the west coming from africa to living there in the us and europe what does it mean and at some point you get saturated with that and then you have um, novels like Kintu that, you know, everyone was like, oh, it was first published in Africa. And all the Western publishers are like, where is the historical fiction? Where is the Africa before colonization and other parts? And the problem is, I find, at least with Western publishers, they are not expecting commercial fiction from Africans. And they expect you to follow these African trends. So if you're not writing at the time that Americana comes out a story about being in the diaspora, they're not interested. And I've even spoken to publishers and they, what they say is, what they wait for is for one publisher to take a wild chance 
see the success and then they go and commission the same kind of story. And even actually Shimamanda, apparently her first um, publisher was like, I'll take a chance, you know. He, the person, and this was Purple Hibis, they were kind of like, yeah, you know, maybe. And look at that maybe turned out to be, you know, a million dollar opportunity. So it's very difficult. And at the same time, the fact that they don't expect commercial fiction also means that they do pay attention more to commercial fiction written by Westerners because that's what sells, you know. And the assumption is that readers do not want to read an African person writing um, like a crime crimes anthology or series or a romance. They want to read about that authentic African story. So I, I don't know how to answer that question. Yeah, I mean, there's many sides to what commercial fiction is. And like you say, they, in publishing terms, they copy what was the last big hit, whether that was Americano or, or whatever. But commercial in terms of genre, if, if we mean crime fiction or uh, uh, chick lit romance or sci-fi, I think really when I read and when I'm thinking uh, about could I translate this, could it publish, it's always really about quality. If it's a good but trashy, fun, if it but, but good and I'm turning the pages, yeah, let, 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 let's publish it. Um, but yeah, so, so, so it can be any genre, but it, 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 as long as it's uh, it's got some drive and uh, and uh, uh, quality, or a, a well told, uh, uh, well controlled narrative in the, in that sense, it's probably going to be a bit harder to find its place in the world. But it, it, it will do uh, because you know when we run uh, this imprint, Deadless Africa. A bit like Jesse Munz. We're, we're literature lovers. We're, we do it for this. But the rest of the publishing world, it's money. It's a business. And if, if they hear that something sold a lot of copies in Nairobi, they're going to want to publish it there because they think, hmm. But so, so there is a space. Maybe it's, it's harder to uh, pitch initially for, for certain... Unfortunately, you probably... Uh, your average... Speaking about Britain, your average British reader interested in an African book is going to be maybe a bit more intellectually inclined and wants to, think, rather than a, a... But the reader of a genre fiction probably doesn't care where it's from. If it ends in their hands, they'll read it. So, so the, the, it, it, it would find its way there. So, so if you've got a great crime novel in you, get it written and, and send it to us. I'll, uh, I'll give it a read. I have a reaction to about uh, selling books and doing money. Uh, last year, we organized a meeting in the Minister of Culture and Tourism in Maputo, uh, and they called all cultural managers. And in the end of the minister, many musician managers, or all musician managers, came with the BMWs, GP, uh, Navarras, and things like that. And all literary managers came with the uh, Boda Boda and the Matatus. Um, wow. On that note, <laughs> um, I, ha I have one last question. Um, the novel is such a, like a privileged form it locks out so many people. Um, it is so reliant on a certain form of infrastructure that, that um, gives some people access and locks other people out. And so I'm wondering where else stories are living in the spaces that you are moving in and where some of us might be able to access those stories um, and how the storytelling has morphed away from the traditional novel on the page? Um, well, I can only speak for Guinea, in Guinea-Bissau, or, well, a little bit broad in terms of Lucifer Africa, is that one thing that when people sort of ask, oh, um, you want to read books from Lucifer Africa, um, there's not, the production of literature is not as strong as 
other countries, but we do have a lot of poets. And sometimes um, I think to myself, actually, maybe what we should be looking at is poetry. Because um, if you look at actually a lot of the, um, the people that took over after colonialism ended, presidents, uh, ministers, a lot of them actually used to be poets. So you look at Agustin Uneto in Angola, he was a poet. Amirka Cabral wrote poems, um, many of them. And I don't know, sometimes I wonder if it's also the nature of colonialism and the war that we fought that has this sort of inspires this nostalgia and melancholy and so much writing to come out of poetry. But um, beyond actually looking at poetry, novel, one thing that I think Lucifer in Africa has produced a lot and we don't also, other people don't recognize this music, you know. Um, Kizomba, uh, which it has inspired Zouk in other French Caribbean countries, Kuduru, um, Semba, well, Angola is the biggest to produce, but these are also in these songs. They are telling essentially a story. And I think, you know, it's, it's a, it would be good sometimes maybe for us to challenge what we think of, not just say maybe literature, but storytelling, you know? And I feel like if, um, look, thinking back of um, when Ngugi, he was, uh, I think, poised to win a Nobel Prize for literature, and I forget the name of the guy who won in the end. He was a musician, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Bob Dylan, you know? If he can win a, a Nobel Prize for literature, then we maybe should consider to look at music as another form of storytelling and, and literature in our own culture, Lucifer in Africa. And I think if we do that, then you then find a big, a even bigger space uh, of literature and storytelling. Yeah, this is what's happened in the Lusophon world. Uh, the poet is the best way of express ourselves in Lusophon words. This is why even many novelists, they use it to be a poet. Yeah, the poet is the, yeah, the poet is that thing that we are searching. Even when we are reading a novel, I'm reading a novel searching for poetical things. Yeah, yeah. I think as, as people, we are very, actually poetic. And even when you read the writing, for example, Pauline Chizian, when you read her books, I, for me, I'm somebody who actually likes begin, I like a story to move, to have an end. I don't feel satisfied. But with her, I find it hard to, to feel that way because every single word is basically a poetic. It's just so beautiful, so amazing that the story itself, I, I don't even care about it, it's the words. Yeah, I mean, I reiterate some of those things. Uh, obviously, something that came to mind is sort of rap, hip hop. Uh, that should be maybe taught in schools. People, you know, people can engage with that. From my very specific translator perspective, I have decided that I should be more bold in if I find a book, uh, and I'm going to try it with one from Sao Tome and Principe. There's never been anything from Sao Tome and Principe translated into English. There's not a book culture there, there's not an industry. I have read a book that's quite good, but it's not been edited. The guy had no support. He just did it himself. So, of course, nobody was there to help him. Maybe I can help him as I translate it. Maybe I can also help him structure it. So I'm going to try and explore that to, to you know, done in the right way uh, without imposing my ideas, but rather sharing my experience uh, and knowledge. Then that might be a way of bringing more stories through. I just want to add actually to Jetro's point that as much as I said that the production of literature is not as lively as other places, people are writing books, but they I find that for example in Guinea Bissau, I have an uncle who's written about five books just because he he loves being a writer. He does his own design of the cover, he pays for the printing himself. Even Abdullah Sila actually had his own publishing house. All of his books were published through his publishing house. He, people are writing books and doing it all by themselves. And I think it also shows also the love of the written words 
because it's, people are not doing it because they want to be, you know, oh, I want to be a writer, I want to be the next human man. They're actually doing it because they love it and they feel writers. And it doesn't matter actually having that external validation. So there are books there. We just need to maybe champion them more and open up. It's very difficult to read one Mozambican book without finding one word, ocean. Yes, ocean, yeah. We, we live to the ocean. We woke up for in the ocean. We think as the ocean. This is why all these books you will find one word, ocean. This is what do we mean as a... Uh, Mozambique has a country of poets, but it's not only Mozambique. Maybe it's, uh, the Portuguese or, or African Lusophone word, world, is the world of poet. What a beautiful way to end the session. Thank you so much for your generosity and really for giving us this little taste and an and, and intro into the world of stories in Lusophone Africa. Before we end, if I can just, if you can share with us um, what you're working on now and um, if the work will be available at the Festival Bookshop. And um, for everyone here, there'll be, there's lots more planned over the next day and tomorrow there'll be an opportunity to hear more. Um, so check your program out um, and I'll just pass the mic on and if you can share uh, the thing that's exciting you in the moment. Well, I'm helping the Dina launch uh, the latest translation that I completed, The Mad Woman of Serrano, this afternoon. So please do come to see that. And books are on sale uh, out there. I think it's uh, a 1,000, I think. So please come and get that. I'm doing some other little translations of uh, little bits and pieces, trying to get another Cape Verde narrative non-fiction book, uh, trying to find a publisher for that. So hopefully in a few years you'll be able to read that one as well. Well, besides working on my own writing, I'm actually working on doing a sample translation of Jethro. Uh, and on this particular book, uh, it's called Esadama Bat Boy. Uh, I have not yet found a way to translate that title. <laughs> but, yes, <laughs> I know exactly what it means, but I just don't know how to express it in English yet. Um, but it, it's by this wonderful uh, Portuguese Angolan writer called Yara Monteiro. And the reason why I'm so excited by this book is that um, it's basically a story about this woman, uh, Angolan woman who lives in Portugal, has her life all set up, is almost about to marry this nice little man. And she just decides that she wants to go back to Angola because she left Angola many years as a child and lost contact and never saw her mother again. And her mother used to be uh, part of, um, like an activist. And so she decides to go back to Angola to rediscover Angola, but also find the traces of her mother. And I find it really interesting because this is, I see this is a very important story, a story that actually many of us in the diaspora can relate to. And yeah, and I think it's, it's it's a story that needs to be told, so, yeah. As a publisher, I'm just reading poems to analyze novels, printing, and selling books, but I will still, or oh, I still remind walking on uh, Boda Boda and Matatus, because this is my business, thank you. <laughs> Jesse, Yovanka, Jethro, thank you so much. Thank you so much to the audience. It has just begun. Go out and enjoy Macondo. I hope you have a lovely rest of the day. Thank you.